Hi everyone. This is uh, Brother Richie, minister from the Apostolic Faith Church in Seattle, Washington. I recently visited a place in the Sonoran Desert called Saguaro National Park, which is a cactus forest located in Tucson, Arizona. As the name implies, Saguaro National Park is home to the nation's largest cacti, the giant saguaro, or Carnegia gigantea, which is recognized as the universal symbol of the U.S. Southwest, with its iconic arms that bend upward. Now, saguaros are pretty much found exclusively in the Sonoran Desert. It is estimated that saguaros can live to be as much as 150 to 200 years old, can grow between 40 to 60 feet tall, and can weigh between 3,200 and 4,800 pounds. In fact, saguaros are the largest cactus in the United States. But what you may not know about this cactus is that Arizona has some very strict regulations about the harvesting, collection, or even the uproot and destruction of this species. Saguaros are protected under the Native Plant Protection Act, which makes it illegal to vandalize a saguaro, harm a saguaro, steal a saguaro, or even transplant a saguaro. You see, if a person is found cutting down a saguaro, it is actually considered a felony that can result in fines and even up to 25 years in prison. In other areas, such as this national park I visited, a saguaro cannot be removed at all. In fact, if you have a saguaro cactus on your own property, cutting it down is a crime. Homeowners and landowners are required to notify the Arizona Department of Agriculture if they have plans to remove one of these cacti. In the end, such laws, environmental programs, and places like wildlife preserves are put in place to protect as well as mitigate the damaging impact of our modern civilization. These laws, programs, and preserves offer shelter and protection for plants, animals, and habitats of many types, as well as help people understand and appreciate the natural world God has made. It also helps to avoid tragedies, such as this one, the dodo bird. The dodo bird is an extinct flightless bird that was endemic to the islands of Mauritius, off the coast of Africa near Madagascar. It was a bird that went extinct about 300 years ago and is among the most well-known examples and icons of wildlife extinctions that were caused by man. However, the dodo is by no means the only animal that has met this fate at the hands of modern society. Since 1900, nearly 500 species of animals have gone extinct. That's the terrible news. But the good news is we have become much more aware of the impact man can have on the habitats and wildlife all around us. Recall that God gave man dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. The Lord God also took man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, to essentially take care of it. But unfortunately, at times we haven't been the best stewards of God's amazing and awesome creation. But today things have changed and there are many efforts, initiatives and organizations and campaigns to protect and save whatever needs to be saved. And the list is actually pretty long. For instance, we have Save the Whales. We have Save the Sea Turtles. Save our sea lions. Save the coral reefs. Save the tigers. Save the giant panda. Save the lions. Save the monarch butterfly. Save the grasslands. Save the wetlands. Save our jungles. Save the oceans, save the rainforest, and of course, ultimately, save our whole planet. But here is the question I think that sometimes we miss. With mankind so actively trying to save habitats, wildlife, and the planet itself, who is going 
to save man. Well, many would say that all the, with all the damage that we have done to the earth, man doesn't deserve to be saved. But that simply isn't so. You see, when God looked upon the earth and sent his only begotten son, it wasn't to, to save the whales, it wasn't to save the turtles, it wasn't to save the tigers, the pandas, or even save the butterflies, or even save the planet. When God sent his only begotten son, it was actually to save man. Because whether man realizes it or not, mankind truly is the one that needs to be saved. So again, I am Brother Richie, minister from the Apostolic Faith Church in Seattle, Washington. This is a broadcast of our Sunday afternoon devotional. Glad you could join us. We'd like to invite you to our upcoming Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And don't forget we have our Sunday morning services currently running in our church at 7420 9th Avenue, Northeast Seattle, Washington. Keep in mind that we are limited in our Sunday morning services by the state safety standards as far as capacity goes. So if you have any service inquiries, they can be sent to Apostolic Faith Church Seattle at gmail.com. Also, subscribe to this YouTube channel for other sermons, Bible studies, and devotionals, which can also be found on the church website, which is afcseattle.org. Again, thank you for joining and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let us once again come before the secret place of the Most High to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Tonight, I simply ask that you open up our eyes and our hearts to receive the truth and inspiration that comes through the Word of God. And may we tonight understand the story of salvation and the price that was paid to save and to redeem all of mankind. Amen. So hello everybody. Um, I'm in my hotel room. This particular hotel room was, was, wasn't was very um, large or at least didn't have a, a nice blank wall that I could use as my background. So unfortunately this is the best I could do in my background. Uh, I hope it's not uh, too too distracting. Uh, every other wall that I that I uh, looked at in this hotel room um, had the, something very distracting on top of it, or just just wasn't suitable. Um, so this is this is actually uh, the best I could do. So I, I I apologize for that. So let's let's just continue and hope for the best here. Okay, now um back to our topic. Now Christmas was was uh, just. Uh, a couple of a couple of months ago, just a little while ago, and there is a famous Christmas song that I feel aptly alludes or references the current dilemma of mankind, and that song is uh, "O Holy Night." Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sing it for you. That's not my department by any means. But the lyrics go basically like this: "O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining." It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he, till he appears and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. <clears throat> now sometimes um, we, we miss we missed uh, some of the words or we missed some of the lines because we focus on on the the very wonderful lines um, that are in the song. But uh, but there are a couple of things that I, I want to point out in this song that are, are I think are very important when it comes to describing the dilemma of man in this world, especially after the the, the sin entered into this world. It says long lay the world in sin and error pining. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, um, in sin and error uh, craving or yearning, till he appears and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, or the, 
the weary, the exhausted, and the fatigued world rejoices. There's some, there's some words in there that, that really aptly describe the situation that man is in. We are, we are in a world of sin and error and we, we are pining, we are craving, we are yearning, uh, for, for something, something more. Uh, we are in a weary world, uh, an exhausted world. We, we, we sometimes feel exhausted or fatigued, uh, in this world because, because of the, the situation that we are in. And, and, and I think this song, even though we miss these lines uh, many times, the song aptly describes where mankind is at, even even today, not just back then, but he, but even today. The Book of Romans tells us, uh, "For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now." Very similar words. Romans 8, the, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Th those are not, those are not uh, very happy words, but, uh, but let's examine them. The whole creation groaneth. Again, the whole creation, not just man, the, the whole of creation. That is, that is partly why we find ourselves trying to trying to save everything. We find ourselves trying to save the whales, we're trying to save the turtles, we're trying to save the pandas, the butterflies, the rainforest, and even our planet. We, we are trying to save everything because the whole, like the Bible says, the whole of creation suffers in the bondage and decay since sin entered into the world. So although it was a man that disobeyed God, it is the world that is paying the entire price of the sin and the disobedience of man. So again, the whole of creation groaneth, the whole of creation travaileth, and we're trying to save the whole planet because of what we have done. And so, it, so, and so the whole creation seems to need saving because it is in a dire, if not miserable, state. And the consensus among people today is that we need to do everything that we can to save this planet and everything that is in it, which, which I have no contention with. However, uh, we should not miss the point that when God reached out to save something in this earth, when God reached out to save something in the whole of his creation, he reached out and he chose to save man. Not the butterflies. He reached out and chose to save man of all the whole of his creation. And I think one of the problems we have when we go about trying to preserve and save everything in this planet is that we don't realize that it is us. <laughs> it is us who needs saving. And until we realize that we need saving as much as anything else in this creation, we will never cry out to the one and only God that can save us. And I believe that many people never get saved be, because they just don't believe they need to be saved. They think the whale needs to be saved. They think the, the panda needs to be saved. They think the lion and the tiger needs to be saved. They think, uh, the planet needs to be saved. But, but, but most people, I think, don't realize that they need to be saved. And therefore they never cry out for help. Of course, John 3, 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The other thing I could add to that is, God did not send his Son into the world to save the pandas. God sent his son into the world so that we might be saved. So God sent his only son, 
Jesus Christ to, to execute a plan to save mankind from perishing. And this plan to save mankind, not the rainforest, not the butterfly, and not the panda, this plan to save mankind required that Jesus go to the cross, which is a, a scene or, or a picture that, that, that we, have, we have seen many, many times in paintings or in, or in sculpture. We've seen this picture of Jesus hanging on the cross many, many times. And I think people too often look at that picture of Jesus hanging on the cross and see a sad or at least a very somber image of a helpless man being unjustly executed. I think that that's how many people, even Christians, I think, I think, I think that's how many people see the, the picture of the cross. They, they see a helpless, though innocent, helpless individual hanging on the cross who is being unjustly executed for having committed no crime. I think that's a lot of, a lot of the imagery we get when we think about the cross, even look at a picture of the cross. But I, but I think that image is very, very much incorrect. In Matthew 27, we read this entire account of Jesus on the cross. It's, it's a very vivid account of Jesus on the cross and his interaction with, with those, uh, that were, that were down beneath him. So, so Matthew 27, um, I'll start at verse 39. It says, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from that cross. Likewise also the, the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others, but himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. The Bible also says in verse 44, the thieves also, which are crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Luke 23 gives us a, <clears throat> gives us even more detail of how he interacted with those, with those uh, thieves, the malefactors, which are hanged there on his, on his right and his left. It says that one of the malefactors, which are hanged, railed on him saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. So, so here's the picture. Jesus Christ is, is hanging on the cross. There are those who are passing by. And of course, remember that, um, there was that sign above Jesus that said, Jesus, the King of the Jews. And they that passed by looked, they wagged their head. They reviled him, and then they said to him, if you be the king of the Jews, with that sign above him, if you be the king of the Jews, come down from that cross and prove it. The chief priests and, and the scribes and the elders also, they, they came and, and they mocked him. And they, and they, and they said, if thou be the king of the Jews, come down from that cross, come down, prove yourself, show us that you are the king, come down from that cross. And then, of course, the, one of the thieves essentially said the same thing. Bring us down from the cross. Bring, bring yourself down from the cross and bring us down from the cross. And when we picture or visualize the cross, we, we typically see the figure of Jesus looking so powerless. I mean, he looks absolutely powerless. You just, you look up there. He looks powerless. Isn't that right? And the strong, um, strong Roman soldiers, uh, Tied, they, they, they tied and pinned and, and nailed his hands to the cross. And then they, they tied and they, and they pinned his feet to that wooden cross. And then after they, they pinned him to the cross, they, they hoisted or they, or they lifted the cross 
into place so that Jesus hung there from his hands and from his feet, making him look absolutely helpless as well as absolutely powerless. And, it, and now, his, now his enemies felt emboldened. His enemies felt confident in their victory. They, they, they were at the cusp of victory. And, and they were so emboldened by, by looking at, at Jesus, looking so helpless on the cross. They were confident as they hurled their insults at the Son of God, feeling that no recourse or means to escape uh, existed. They not only mocked and, and, and insulted him, they began to dare him. They dared him. <clears throat> and they said, now let us see. Let us see if you can come down from that cross. All, all the things you have done. All the people you have saved. All the people you have healed. Even, even raising uh, people from the dead. Now let's see you do this. Let's see if you can come down from that cross. You realize there is probably no other person in the history of crucifixions that would have received such a dare except Jesus himself. No other individual um, would have been challenged in this manner, challenged to come down from the cross. Nobody would have been challenged to do this. Because, because when you see a person on the cross and, and the nails are pinning them to the cross and they're tied to the cross and their feet are pinned to the cross, th there is no hope that they can come down. So, so, so no challenge such as this would be given. But, but Jesus was challenged to do something that no other person was ever on the, ever on a cross was challenged to do. Come down. Come down from that cross. Again, I, I think people too often look at a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross and see a sad image of a completely helpless man being unjustly executed. But again, I, I think that image is, is actually very incorrect. The real image we should be seeing when looking at the cross is not helplessness. It is actually one of power. Power. You see, if Jesus was unable, incapable, of coming down from the cross, I would say it was a helpless image of a completely powerless man. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus did have the ability to come down from the cross. He did have the ability to do the very thing that he was being dared to do. If thou be the Son of God, if thou be the King of the Jews, come down from that cross. And Jesus had that ability. But he chose and he willed himself to stay on the cross to do what? To save mankind. And when you understand this, the image of Christ on the cross becomes an image, not of not of helplessness, because he could come down from the cross. It becomes an image of power, even victory, because he willed himself to the cross. The challenge here was not to see if Jesus could come down from the cross. That, that, that would have been easy. That would have been no issue at all. That would have been no problem at all. Jesus was the one individual who could come down and bring himself down from the cross. The nails could not hold him there. He could bring himself down from the cross. No, the real challenge, the real challenge, the real match, the real contest with the powers of darkness was not to see if he could come down from the cross. It was to see if he would willingly stay on it. If he would willingly stay on the cross. And so the mocking and extraordinary temptation that was hurled at Jesus was, was not, not a see if you can come down. Because the challenging part for Jesus was not to come down from the cross. It, it, it was to stay on it. Because he could have easily come down. 
It was very different from anybody else that, that, that was crucified on the cross. Jesus had all the capability, and he said so. He had all the capability to come down from the cross. No, the, the, the match, the contest, and the real challenge was to stay on that cross. He could have easily come down. And the mockers said, he saved others. Himself, <laughs> he cannot say. Here, the, the, those who mocked affirmed and acknowledged one of the most profound truths about Jesus, and that is, he saved others. Yes, Jesus went around saving others, and he was about to save even more. If he could just stay and endure the cross. I've heard people say that, that love kept Jesus on the cross, and I can't say that I have any disagreement with that. But I think Hebrews 12 gives us insight into the motivation. It says, Hebrews 12 tells us, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now here we go. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Who for the joy that was set before him endured, he, he, he braved or he would stood the cross, despising the shame, scorning that shame, and is set down at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. In the end, Jesus did not do this to, to save the rainforest or the plant. He did it to save us. I think um, too often we save the victory party, you might say. We save the victory party for Easter and the resurrection, but I think that is, that is somewhat misguided. The victory started here. The victory is here. It is on the cross. The resurrection is just the, the continuation of the victory party over death, but, but it is here. It is here on the cross where he endured, he braved, he withstood the cross. It is here that he, he despised the shame. It is on the cross where he resisted the extraordinary temptation. Think about this temptation. It is on the cross where he resisted the extraordinary temptation to come down and to prove once and for all to his mocking critics and enemies that he was indeed the Son of God, that he was indeed the King of the Jews. I mean, that's an enormous temptation. But where, if he did do that, if he did come down to prove that he was the Son of God, that he was the King of the Jews, where would that have even left us? It would have left us all in an irredeemably lost state, with no hope and not even no resurrection. And the world would have continued to groan. I'm going to start to close here with uh, 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> First chapter. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross. Listen again. The preaching of the cross. To them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. See, the power of God was demonstrated on the cross. For the preaching of the cross to, to them that perish, it is foolishness. To, to, to them that don't believe, they even need to be saved. It's just foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. There's tremendous power in the resurrection, but I want us to understand there's tremendous power that was demonstrated on the cross as Jesus willed himself to the cross. 
And so the next time you picture or visualize the cross, I hope you no longer see Jesus as a helpless or powerless figure hanging from the cross. No, the next time you picture or you visualize the cross, I hope you see strength. I hope you see the power of God. For again, the real contest with the, the powers of darkness was to see if he could come, wasn't, was not to see if he could come down from the cross. The real contest, so the real match with the powers of darkness was to see if he could willingly remain on it. To come down was easy. It was to see if Jesus Christ, who could easily come down from the cross, would willingly remain on it and stay on it. And hallelujah, he did. Hallelujah, he did. To save as much as we like saving the animals of this world, it was not to save them, it was to, to save us the lost, and the dying. Let's just pray. We thank you today, Lord, for the power and the strength that you demonstrated on that cross. For the cross demonstrates the power of God, the will and the desire of God to, to reach out to save mankind. Not to save this planet, but to reach out and to save mankind, to save the, the, this wor world, the whole of the creation which had grown, to, to reach out and to save mankind which started disobedient in a garden, but now, because of the power of the cross, has the ability to come before the Lord, to realize that that. They need salvation and to come before the Lord and to cry out unto God for that salvation and receive the power of forgiveness, of grace, and of the love of God. We thank you, Lord, that this grace is, is free unto us all. And we thank you, dear God, that you did not come down from the cross, but you endured it for the joy that was set before you, the joy you knew would come from seeing the salvation of mankind, the salvation of this world. In your precious name, amen.